Welcome to the show. I'm Danny Cannell and for Jason Whitlock, and I'm going to tell you why the Steelers' latest drama is just more proof they're not going all the way this year. And I'm Jason McIntyre in for Colin Cowherd, and I'll tell you why Isaiah Thomas just made a completely ridiculous request of his old team. Speak for yourself starts now. Ooh, it's getting hot already in here with these takes from McIntyre. Oh, yeah, baby. Yeah. Hello and welcome. We're joined today by Fox NFL analyst Mark Schlereth and longtime NFL coach Charlie Weiss. Let's start with a strange story out of Pittsburgh where Steelers offensive coordinator Todd Haley was injured after being shoved to the ground outside a bar called Tequila Cowboy. I guess they have <laughs> great guac or something. On New Year's Eve, Pittsburgh has had no shortage of drama this year from Antonio Brown's early season meltdown to conflict over national anthem protest to last week's war of words with James Harrison. Jason, will the Steelers' constant drama derail their season? I don't think so, Dan. Come on, these are the drama kings of the NFL, are they not? I mean, we're so used to this, whether it's Ben Roethlisberger doing something silly, Le'Veon Bell popping off, Antonio Brown, Brown, Mr. Facebook Live. I'm not that concerned with these guys. They love to air it publicly. Who I am concerned with, Charlie, your former team, the New England Patriots. They really are the drama kings this season. I mean, Danny, think about this. Their, their coordinators, McDaniels and Patricia, are interviewing across the league. They've been, the requests have been made from the Colts, the Giants. Everybody wants a piece of them. Then you've got the Bill Belichick versus Alex Guerrero, the spiritual guru, Tom Brady's guy. They're feuding. He's been kicked off the sidelines, no more team flights. And, of course, Tom Brady. I mean, Mark, we've seen Tom Brady struggle. This was his worst month in three years, our research oh, team hey, tells better me. Jump Struggling on. significantly. There is a lot of drama in New England, some Danny. Problems, I'm most concerned some problems with the are Patriots. better to have than others. Let's address the first one. I mean, Romeo and I went through the exact same thing. There's no distraction. You go to work. Okay, when he gives you that window of opportunity, you go interview, then you come back to work. Okay, and we won championships doing it that way. I mean, we didn't lose doing it that way. You just have to be able to compartmentalize. You know, you have to break it down saying, this is when I'm doing this, and this is when I'm doing that. Last that's I number checked, one. It is a bye week, too. I mean, they have yeah, some that's number one. Of time. That's number one. No, number two, I mean, if Tommy wants a personal, a, you know, personal guru for what he does, that's fine. If Bill wants him away from the rest of the team, that's his prerogative. Tommy can pick whoever he, whoever he wants to help him on the side. Bill can keep people who aren't, aren't It's not just Brady, though. He's got 20 clients It doesn't on make the a team. difference. Yeah. Bill, that's Bill's team. It's not Tommy's team. So, I, don't, so I, I, think we're, I think I'm with you. I think we're all on the page. I think for the Steelers, it is a problem. And it, we didn't even have enough. We could do an hour show on the litany of issues they've had, whether it's Big Ben's annual retirement, you know, <laughs> self, uh, you know, self you know, look, uh, looking at his life and seeing if he wants to continue playing. Right. Martavis Bryant's demanding trades. Le'Veon want, yeah. wants the ball. Now you've got um, Ben Roethlisberger says he wants Jacksonville, the team that he threw five picks and two pick sixes against. Yeah. James Harrison is clearly in their head. Now you've got your offensive coordinator where there are already issues between Ben and him back and forth. I think what you see, the biggest problem when these off-the-field issues creep in is when you face adversity, and you are going to face adversity at some point in the playoffs, yeah. and that's when I think it takes its toll on the Steelers. Here's, here's the issue that I have with Pittsburgh, and you mentioned all those things, and what separates them from New England that we talked about, is that you have a lack of perceived discipline with the Steelers. And I know they're 13-3, and three, but when you watch them play, there's a bit of, we play to the level of our competition. When we have a big game, we're totally dialed in. You know why? Because we know it's a big game. When we're gonna play the New England Patriots, it's a big game, we'll be dialed in. When we play an also-ran, you know what? We'll give up 30, 40 points to Joe Flacco and the Ravens, who are average at best on offense. That's the fluctuation. Now, they still find a way to win those games, and ultimately because they've got great players <laughs> on both sides of the ball, and you know what? Their coaches put those great players in positions to win, and, and that's ultimately why. But I'm with you. I think it derails them down the road because of the focus and the lack thereof at times or the lack of discipline. And, and the Todd Hellions, let's just say this. First of all, the game's over. It's New Year's Eve. If you want to go out with your wife, you can go out with your wife, mm -hmm. okay, uh, in his defense. That being said, I never would be out with my wife because <laughs> I wouldn't put myself out in, in, in a public – I would not put myself out in public because I would not want to be talking about what we're doing football-wise. 
You know, I'd be home, you know, I'd be home celebrating New Year's Eve with my wife at home. I think the biggest problem with that incident, though, if Todd's hip, as they say, is bad enough where he might have to coach the game from the box, actually, it's easier to call a game from the box. It's, you know, there's no distractions. You could see the field better. Okay, it's easier to call the game. But the chemistry that they have that I've seen for all these years is Todd being on the sideline, you know, being able to communicate with the quarterback and everyone else. And you take that away. I think that uh, that's a big difference when all of a sudden your coordinator, who always has been down on the field, now is not visibly there. He's up in the box. All right, on to the other side of Pennsylvania, guys. The Eagles are going through some drama of their own. Nick Foles' terrible play the last couple weeks has put their entire season in doubt. Gotten a lot of people wondering exactly how committed Doug Peterson is to his struggling quarterback. It's hard to say uh, right now and, until until I'm in that situation. Quite honestly, I, I, listen, it's a it's a one game season, and and you know uh, it's it's hard to be in desperation mode. But if you're in that mode, you know who knows. Um, I do know this: it's not about one guy. A lot of contributing factors uh, go into uh, going to winning a game. Peterson quickly backtracked from that answer with the NFL Network's Ian Rappaport tweeting, quote, Eagles coach Doug Peterson just texted me after his press conference. My guy is Nick Foles. End of story. That is significant. Danny, you got an issue with Peterson's handling of Nick Foles? Man, Doug Peterson was a longtime quarterback in the NFL. Had a great career. It's why he's a great coach. Yeah. What he did from that press conference, from that podium, was basically throw a pick six as far as the <laughs> handling of his quarterback, who is very mentally fragile right now. We've seen him in the last two games struggle. I think some of the panic has been overblown. But the most critical thing you have to build up in Nick Foles is confidence. Now, you might go into Nate Sudfeld, pull him aside in that quarterback room and say, hey, you better be ready to play. I might pull you in if something <laughs> happens. But you can't do this in this spot with as much as at stake as the Philadelphia Eagles have right now. You can't shatter this quarterback's confidence when all he needs is for it to be built up. I don't know. I kind of agree with you. But at the same time, I feel like this is him pulling a page out of the art of war, that classic book, Military Tactics. I mean, he came out this week and said, Jay Ajayi is going to have a big factor in the offense. Like, we're going to work him in more. Jay Ajayi's been there two months. Like, it just, it feels like he's just BSing a little bit. And, and why would you throw, as you said, a struggling Nick Foles under the bus right before the biggest start of his career at this point? So, to me, it makes no sense. I, I, Mark, you, but, you, you have not been high on Nick Foles at all. No, 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 no. I, li I actually like Nick Foles. I think Nick Foles is fine. I think Nick Foles is, is uh, I, I think when you look at him and you try to compare him to Carson Wentz, the difference being is that when things break down as they do about 30% of the time, Carson Wentz going to make a play. Nick Foles, he doesn't have that kind of athleticism. He doesn't have that kind of um, improvisation skills. So I think that's a big difference there. So Doug Peterson is right. You've, it's not on him. It's on the rest of the team. It's we've got to manage him well. We've got to run the ball well. And, oh, by the way, now the last two games notwithstanding because they were low-scoring games, but you were playing against the Raiders who had mailed it in. You were playing against the Cowboys, and you had nothing to play for, so you're playing a fourth preseason game there because you're trying to keep your team healthy. You look at their defense against the Giants, Eli Manning and a, I'm telling you what, a team on offense that has a bunch of guys playing that probably shouldn't be playing. That's what I'm telling you, especially up front. They hung 440 yards of, of passing on a, a – I mean, that was like, that was like fishing. I mean, there, Foles, oh, I mean, there Foles was – saved. Foles threw four touchdowns and zero picks. In against the worst secondary in the league. Right. Oh, okay. give him too much credit. With that being said, I don't think his intent – was a throw Foles under yeah. the bus. No, but I that's think why, that's I, I think he was just given the politically correct answer, saying, look, in the playoffs, you do you have to be ready for anything. I don't think any – when I watched that, that didn't imply – I had no inference that I would have drawn that Peterson wasn't his guy. I mean, I didn't say – well, that wasn't a vote of confidence. You know, that's the, that's the type of answers you give when you're asked that question. You go, well, would you ever have the other guy ready to go? Well, I don't know. But I mean, have, that's if the situation presents itself, no, but this yeah, is, but this is where, but this is where I feel like Doug Peterson has a pulse 
on the sense of the city, the fan base, and maybe even his locker room, where there's a sense of desperation and panic yeah. around the way Nick Foles has played the last couple weeks. So the minute that question comes up, you you shout it down Defend and you say, Nick Foles yeah. is my guy. There is nothing to worry about. No way are we benching him. I mean, him. Charlie, you remember Nick Foles' first playoff start against the Saints. He was a deer in the headlights. I know he performed okay, but he was a captain check down in that game. So he was afraid to throw oh. down the field with Chip Kelly, and it got kind of ugly okay, in that one, and they great. lost. Let's go back to the Giant game. That's Is that... Just a couple weeks ago, yeah, right? Yeah. You're talking last year? Oh, there's several last years year? ago. But a playoff start is <laughs> okay, different than well, facing we're talking a bad a couple team. Weeks. Yeah. Take, yeah. Let's talk a couple weeks ago. Okay, okay his, his first real game in there was the game against the Giants, right? Mm -hmm. Wasn't that his first oh, real? The, he, he played, played the, the fourth Ram, quarter of the Rams the, game. The Rams game. Not the whole played. game, right? Though, right? Yeah. So his first yeah. game in yes. there. He needed, to, he needed to throw those four touchdown passes because the secondary got torched. And he did. The guy looked like a like a quarterback that you could win with. Look, at, I went through it in 1990. Okay, we lost Phil Sims. And I was a low-level, entry-level coach at the time. But we're 10-0, we lose Phil Sims. Okay, we lose to the Eagles in that game. We lose Sims. We go to San Francisco, lose the next game with this guy by the name of Jeff Hostetler. That no one knew who Jeff Hostetler was. As a matter of fact, he was a punt returner. He played a little wide receiver quarterback from West Virginia that just happened to be on the roster. About a month and a half later, everyone knows his name because we won the Super Bowl. So, I mean... But don't they, you think Parcells was building him up as much as he knew, knowing really that it was his only option left? Like, no, that's where I feel like the mistake was made. Because well, I'm, I'm with you. That I mean, you have to play into the strengths of your team. Look it. I mean, the front seven at Philadelphia is a strength of their team. Mm -hmm. I mean, those, those, those are some bad muchachos up there. Mm -hmm. I mean, they can rush the passer with four. Okay, those linebackers run really well. I mean, they're going to have to play better on defense for them to win. But playing at home in the playoffs, you know, is, being able, be getting rested up and playing at home in the playoffs, I think the, I think the Eagles are So, be Charlie, Hostetler had not had a lot of experience. Nick Foles, 39 career starts. This isn't a rookie. I'm just well, which I'm is more of a reason, I'm surprised he didn't back Which is up. more of a reason to think that the guy's got a chance. Okay, that he has some experience. I think he'll get it back on track, but he needs to get back his confidence. And that I think this presented another roadblock. But I think if he starts off the game fine, all those issues will be put I, behind him. I know one thing, and I've, I, I, I've done a Philadelphia game, and I've talked to Doug Peterson about that, and I know, I know one thing about coaches sometimes is while they're getting their guy ready, they kind of sometimes neglect the things that you have to do. And what I heard more than anything from Doug Peterson is, We've got to play to our strengths. We can run the ball. We need to. And there was a game they lost early to Kansas City where he literally, I don't remember the, the amount of runs he had, but there was literally no run. There was no running game for a couple of weeks. And I questioned about it. I go, dude, if I was playing for you, we'd have a fight. Like, <laughs> I'm just going to let you know that right now. And we laughed about it. But he's like, yeah, sometimes, you know, you get going and you feel like you're going to, you know, you're going to do this, you're going to do that. And he knows what he's got to do. He knows he's got to dial this thing down. And he knows he's got to support his quarterback. And he'll do that for sure. Welcome back. Jason McIntyre and Danny Cannell in for Coward and Whitlock. Mark Schlereth and Charlie Weiss are back. Let's move to the Rams. They host the Falcons at the Coliseum Saturday night in their first playoff game in Los Angeles in over 30 years. L.A. is one of the most exciting young teams in the league. Emphasis on young. They got a 23-year-old quarterback, 31-year-old coach, and just 21 total playoff games between the whole team. Not that Sean McVay sounds worried. I don't think it's a concern. I think, you know, when I say that, you have a whole lot of respect for experience and, and what that does and the value that it provides. But I do think we've got a confident group. I think we've got a mature group for a young football team. And then those guys in that locker room, you know, the guys that have been in playoff atmospheres, we've got coaches that have been there as well, uh, can provide that leadership in terms of what to expect. I'll be nervous. I mean, I, 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 of course, yeah, you always get nervous. But I think it's more, more excitement and more anxiety and, and you want to get out there than true nervousness. Danny, do you think playoff inexperience will doom the Rams? I do. I think it's the most underrated aspect when you look at teams. When you're breaking down the matchups and you're looking at who's playing who, it's easy to get caught up in Todd Gurley's close to MVP-like season, the wonderful job that Sean McVay has done. He's been spectacular this season. And to overlook the fact that neither one of them have a start in the playoffs at the two most important positions on the field – Look at the – we just saw the incredible college football playoff game between Oklahoma and Georgia. 
And you know what? I saw Lincoln Riley, the head coach of Oklahoma, make just a couple mm. little, Great the littlest point. of mistakes. The squib kick before half, running it three times. Like, you get caught up. Even last year, Kyle Shannon, his first Super Bowl performance. You think he wouldn't like to have some play calls back in that 28-3 win? Every time it's going to come into play. I only had one playoff start with the New York Giants. And I'll never forget, Rod Dauhauer was my quarterback coach. And the week we come in there, it's our first practice. We just get there for meetings. He pulls me into his room, and he, he kind of gave me a warning. He's like, hey, he's like, we're excited. He's like, but this is different. And I was, I was young and dumb. Oh, look, and there so you are, Danny. Naive. And he Ooh. tells me, he's like, he's like, a lot of guys play in their careers, and they never even get this opportunity. It's something special. The speed of the game is going to be different. The pressure is going to be different. We have, it's time to go to work. And you have to try to do everything you can to prep yourself for this moment. And sure enough, in that game, I didn't play great, but we also we started to implode. We had a 19 to three lead. You start playing differently because you're thinking about the next round of the playoffs. We had guys fighting on the defensive side yeah. of the ball. Our best player with the best hands had an onside kick go through oh. his hands. Like it's just yeah, that's it's not your fault. Totally, <laughs> no, no, no. Clearly, <laughs> wasn't my fault. It's a totally different animal, and the only way that you can truly totally learn from it is to be in that in that situation. I tried to get our staff to put together some of my playoff experience, <laughs> but uh, I never got to the NFL. Uh, my big concern here, actually, is not really with the Rams. It's with the Falcons. With Steve Sarkeesian as their offensive coordinator, you look at his playoff experience. What's he, he got? Is he the quarterback? No, but he's the quarterback coach. And is, his quarterback, oh, Charlie, hold on, hold on. His he, quarterback, he, Matt it, Ryan, was the MVP receiver? of the league is last it, is year. Is he Julio and Jones? You look at Matt Ryan's stats Sanu? this year, Charlie. Charlie, Freeman, have you looked at his stats this year? Coleman, Matt Ryan's you want me to keep going? In every <laughs> category. Whoa, Julio backfield. Jones, what how many all those guys catches in the under did Steve Sarkeesian? Did they make Sarkeesian? the playoffs last three. year? Three. Three. Did, hold it. Did Lynn make the playoffs last no. year? <laughs> no. I mean, Charlie, how, you're, you're discounting I, 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 I could have swore I saw him in February. Yeah, I thought so, too. You know, maybe they, I didn't. Maybe I didn't. 28-3. Yeah, but they got hey, there. Let's have the battle. Hey, only only two teams get to get to that game. Okay? Only two teams get there. Okay, and you can sit there at 28-3. You can give about 10 different reasons why that why that happened. One was that number 12 guy from New England. <laughs> okay, but as we mentioned before, I think that Kyle Shanahan would like to have called three runs on the 22-yard line. Probably. Okay, and let that 50-year-old field goal kicker kick another field goal that he never misses, and that would have been the end of that game. Okay, that's only one scenario. I'm only picking one thing from that game. With all the things that happened in that game, there were a lot of things that happened could have made it different. But all the experience that team got going go to that game, that's you – know, look it, ask him. Okay, yeah. he played, <laughs> ask him. Of them. Yeah, no, I, experience – I mean, obviously experience matters. All those things matter. Uh, you know what matters to me more? Because you'll see it in Super Bowls all the time. You'll see one really experienced team and a team that hasn't done it very often. You know what matters is just how you play in that particular game. And sometimes, uh, experience, you can put yourself in, in a pressure situation. Just tell me who's going to play this like it's a game, like it's any other game. And I know that it's not any other game. But the team that ends up playing that way, whether you're young or whether you're old, those are the teams that play well. Does experience matter? Experience always matters. It's always imperative to have experience. But I'm just going to tell you, the team that goes out there and executes is the team that gonna, is going to win this regardless if they have so experience the or not. So is the inexperience of the Rams going to doom I mean, them? Okay, let me just say this. Doom is been, really strong. Doom is strong. I've That's been not in a situation word. where I've been on very experienced teams and we won. <laughs> I, went, I went on a run in 1997 as a six-seed wild card where myself and – one or two other guys had Super Bowl experience. And the team we beat in the Super Bowl went to the Super Bowl and won the Super Bowl the year before. They had – everybody was experienced. But you know what? One team out-executed the other. And that's really what it boils down to is how do you play? How do you show up? Does experience help you in that situation? I do believe it does. But, I, you know, I've seen it go both ways. I just Maybe. don't know – Maybe Sean McVay could throw in some film of the last time the Rams made the playoff, uh, and he can. Yeah. If was he was he watching alive? that, when he was, well, <laughs> yeah. we have we have. He was we one have, year no, old. No, look how old he was. This is some action for you at Ohio. This is his collegiate. Look at this. He's a baby face right there. I will say this. He had the perfect answer. I thought in that press conference, like you have to be impressed with everything that that, he's that done. picture was taken last year. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to tell. I mean, Golf looked like the older one of those two guys going his, at it. His defensive coordinator has had more years of coaching in the NFL than Sean McVay has been alive. <laughs> Wade Phillips. Wade Phillips, And that yes. was obviously Wade's a big reason he wanted to bring him with him. Said he's experienced, yeah. baby. It's a package deal for sure. 
Welcome back. I'm Danny Cannell. He's Jason McIntyre. We're joined now by Fox NBA analyst Chris Broussard and the co-host of The Herd, Christine Leahy. Let's move to Boston, where LeBron James and Kyrie Irving will face off tonight, their second meeting since Kyrie was shipped up to Boston over the summer. The two didn't always see eye to eye in Cleveland, and with Irving gone, LeBron is actually having one of his best seasons of his career. J-Mac, you think he's happy Kyrie is gone? I got to say yes, Danny. Uh, first of all, that Jackie McMullen story today, we all read that. Tremendous piece of journalism, and it kind of speaks to the problems. Listen, if you're in a relationship with somebody and you want it to work out, you kind of let it work out, right? You, you do anything you can to keep the person, and it's pretty clear LeBron did not do everything in his power to keep Kyrie Irving, even though Kyrie hit the most clutch shot maybe in NBA history, certainly in Cavs franchise history. How would you not want to keep that guy? I, to me, I'm just absolutely puzzled by why LeBron didn't do everything in his power to keep him. Well, he's one of the greatest players we've ever seen, but he's also super uh, passive-aggressive, and he has an <laughs> ego that he likes people to bow down to. He's a and star. Kyrie, I mean, absolutely, and he deserves it. But nothing in Cleveland happens without LeBron James' blessing. And this clearly was something he had no problem with, and I think he is much happier without him. You're seeing some of those career numbers, all-time highs, which I think is going to help him get that MVP this season because I don't think the finals are in play. I don't think he's going to get the championship this year. And he's looking at his legacy, and he's saying, what can I do to catch MJ? And it's not going to be the finals, the championship rings. It's going to be MVPs, and that's what he wants this season. This so, is the first time we work together, and I agree with everything that you just said. Right. Jackie McMullen is one of my favorite NBA reporters, and I, I don't think I can remember a single time where she wrote something in one of these great journalistic pieces that she does, and it came back that it was wrong or incorrect even a little bit. And I thought it was really interesting that she said that back in June, the Cavs actually tried to trade Kyrie back then. And that's been a detail that hasn't been reported up until this point. And like you said, if that's true, which I do believe it is because Jackie wrote it, LeBron signed off on it. LeBron wanted Kyrie to be traded back in June. So why, again, would any of us be upset that Kyrie said, okay, I want to leave here? And also, like you said, I think LeBron realizes that a championship's probably not in the cards this year and get an MVP. Kind of get closer to Michael Jordan. And it's a lot easier to do that when you take one of the best players off your team. I actually talked about that trade on your show, The Hurt. I said that Ky one of the reasons he wanted to be traded was he found out that they had talked about trading for Paul George at the draft. And he assumed LeBron knew about it. Because, like you said, nothing happens yeah. without LeBron knowing. Now, LeBron didn't shoot it down, but he also didn't say, let's trade Kyrie. LeBron was just like, that's interesting. <laughs> and exploring a trade is different than shopping a guy. They, to think they shopped Kyrie Irving is ridiculous. But they also understood we have to get better. And we, we're not – we lost four to one. We can get better. And Indiana brought Paul George to them, and they looked at it. But at the end of the day, what happened? They didn't do it. So, to quote LeBron James in Jackie's great piece, Jack – he said, that makes absolutely no sense. Mm -hmm. To think he didn't want Kyrie Irving – if LeBron had had his druthers, this team comes back as it was. So why didn't he fight for him, Chris? He would have. He demanded a trade. No. But he didn't, he didn't, didn't demand a trade. If, if what you are saying is true, that back then they were exploring this trade and they went to LeBron and LeBron didn't say no, that's just as bad. Why is it just as bad? It's Paul George. It wasn't Jay Crowder. It he was Paul George. He didn't do anything to a keep Kyrie there or B, once that trade didn't happen, to make Kyrie feel comfortable? Well, because right after that, Kyrie said, I want out. There was and then Kyrie there. didn't want to talk to him. Right. Well, the, Kyrie the said he's not going you? to. So who are you blaming <laughs> Look, here? Are you blaming Kyrie I'm or LeBron? I'm not blaming anybody because, one, I think Cleveland is fine right now. Oh. I think they're better now. That now <laughs> Kyrie's better the best, without Kyrie. Kyrie is the best player in that trade, but Isaiah Thomas can give you essentially what Kyrie did. Chris. And you got Jay Crowder. Jay Crowder, here's the thing. Jay Crowder's going to be huge for that team because Kyle Korver can't play against the Warriors. And now you got, you, you lost one of your best three-point shooters. Jay Crowder can hit the three and defend so he can replace Kyle Korver. Isaiah, again, not as good as Kyrie, but he gives you plenty that Kyrie did. Number one, he gets to the foul line. Last year, almost twice as much as Kyrie. Over his career, always has gotten there more. Number two, you could argue he's a better passer. He's more of a playmaker for other guys than Kyrie. His career assists 
and season assists are far higher than Kyrie's. Kyrie's got the team he wants. He's the true point guard. He's averaging fewer than five assists a game. So I'm just saying if this team is he fine. He doesn't even play 20 Kyrie, minutes, and well, he's so thing, excited no, about it. No, I'm looking at his career. But here's one of the things I love about LeBron is that he's very involved in his locker rooms, wherever he's been. He likes to get everybody together. He's very much into the team vibe, and I think he has a great pulse on every locker room that he's been in. And why wouldn't he, if he started to see some of this dysfunction creep in, why wouldn't he pull Kyrie aside and try to build him up and try to prevent this from happening? If you knew there was starting to be some sort of rift, why wouldn't you call him aside and say, hey, we could do something really I mean, special. Remember, Keep him happy. Talk I, about this, your future. This was All Kyrie Irving's team. They drafted him number one overall to be the guy well, in Cleveland. <laughs> and then they trade for LeBron because you can't pass that up. Well, and it's like, you're, it's yeah. not your team anymore, Kyrie. It's LeBron's team. So, obviously, I think there was some bitterness on Kyrie's side. Well, that's, and that's and LeBron, LeBron sort of worked to fix that. Well, thing. I don't think he has to do the Dwayne Wade, here's the keys and all that stuff. But you have to work the relationship. If, because I, I disagree with you. Because the Isaiah Thomas, as great as it was last night and seeing him come back was awesome. I'm very curious to see how it works in a seven-game series. What happens in crunch time if there's a last possession? Who's handling the yeah. ball? Who's got it in their hands? That's an awkward situation that we haven't seen play out yet. And we've seen it work with Kyrie. That's why I still have a challenge on that. Well, all I'm saying is to think LeBron did not want Kyrie there is ridiculous. And to think that if the Cavs come to you and say, look, we can get Paul George for Kyrie, to think you don't sit back and say, hmm, that ain't bad. I mean, who who wouldn't say that ain't bad? You Did you win it last year? Years Did row. you win it? <laughs> right. You can get to the finals right, without Paul on. George or Kyrie. Right, right. To Isaiah Thomas, who made his much-anticipated debut with the Cavs last night, putting up 17 points in only 19 minutes. My goodness. But he won't be on the court tonight against his old team. Not only that, Isaiah's also taking some heat for asking the Celtics to play a tribute video they made for him on a different night. <laughs> After one fan told IT to get over himself, he fired back tweeting, quote, get over myself, huh? Oh, that's a reporter that said that to him. <laughs> because I would like to actually play and have my family in the arena to appreciate the love the city organization will show us. It ain't about me, it's about my family. Ha, you get over yourself, you dumbass. <laughs> Danny, <laughs> woo! Do you think Isaiah is ducking the Celtics by sitting out tonight? Absolutely not. Oh. I don't think he's <laughs> ducking them at all. I think, and we talked about this earlier in the week, I think this is not his decision. I think this is the Cavs and the medical staff protecting him, and that's the whole reason they played him last night as opposed to tonight. It was a back-to-back. -back. It's an easy sell. You get him some minutes, you play great, and then you rest him. If this was his first game back, you would be tempted. There's going to be a minute restriction. What happens if he plays 19 minutes like he did last night? It's the fourth quarter, and there's four minutes left, and it's a close game, back and forth, and Isaiah is begging you, let me beat my old team. Let me get in there. Yeah. And you don't want him to extend himself in a situation that could put him at greater risk moving on. I think this is the smart decision for the Cavs. We're on totally different sides here, Dana. <laughs> I think Isaiah Thomas is being so petty over this whole thing. He's still bitter that he got traded out of Boston. And I like Isaiah Thomas. Great guy. Kids easily root for him. But, dude, they didn't trade you to Sacramento, okay? You're in Cleveland with LeBron. Get over yourself and just show up in Boston and get over, get it over with, right? Do it now so that, guess what, the next time they're in Boston, it's like Paul Pierce tribute night. So you're not going to get the ovation that night. And then what, you're going to wait for the Eastern Conference Finals? And then it's going to be a big to-do? Like, just get it over with, rip the Band-Aid off, suck it up. Uh, Christine, I just feel like he's being petty here. You're, you're right in that it is not Isaiah Thomas's decision. It's LeBron's decision. Ooh. And I'm going to give you exactly Whoa. why. This is LeBron controlling everything. Since LeBron left Miami, the Cavs have gone to Miami six times. LeBron has missed half of those Ooh. games, including three of the last four. That's good. So he's a very big proponent in not giving the fans what they want, especially in a nationally televised game. Don't give us the Isaiah Thomas Kyrie back in Boston game. That's very much like LeBron to do. And is it crazy to think that LeBron did not want the spotlight off of him tonight? Oh. <laughs> and I will just, Ooh. I just want to point Ooh. this out. Coming in Did hot. you guys see his New Year's Eve Snapchat or Insta story, I, I, what I LeBron did, did on yes. New Year's Eve for hours <laughs> at the New Year's Eve party with his teammates and family. Yeah. 
uh, giving himself videos, putting the camera on him and rapping for 10 <laughs> minutes of content over the span of hours. That's how he spent the night. Oh. He all does the that attention a lot. On, I, I love that. All the and, 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 oh, yeah. He does that all the time. That's, 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 you know, that is, stop it. That this is, is fired up. Point. Point. He this wants the straight, attention on yeah, This is straight LeBron time. James hate. When he went to Miami and he first went back to Cleveland, did he not give the fans what they wanted? It was the ugliest return homecoming we've ever seen. So what happened to the next three? That was a coincidence? Miami? Look, so you think LeBron went to the Cavs and said, don't let IT play? Absolutely. Oh, my Ooh, gosh. Stop it. Why let, me would he? let me finish. Let me finish. Let me finish. This is utterly ridiculous. Teams do not, as a habit, as a rule, send an injured player back for his first game in an emotional, highly charged, nat hold on, let me finish, nationally televised game. So if the Cavs are sitting there and they say, he can, he's not playing back to back, he can come back against Portland, mm -hmm. or he can come back against Boston, they're not going to choose Boston, just like the Golden State Warriors said a week or two in advance, Steph Curry's first game back will not be Cleveland I, on Christmas Day. That's the rule in the NBA. It's not about him being afraid to, or LeBron. It's certainly not about LeBron. It's got nothing to do with LeBron. I 100% agree <laughs> with you that it doesn't make sense for him to come back against Boston. Okay, so we, but it, how's agree. it LeBron's fault? But you're going to have him come back the day before against Portland? Like, Damian Lillard is not just an easy player to go up against. It's not about so the player not, you're if, going if against. It's about the hype fine, of the game. Even the hype. You're telling me that they decided he had to come back on this game and they couldn't just wait two more. They're sending a Why? clear you're, message. You, you, you're trying to win a championship. You want to get this back. You want to you wanna get this back guy back as soon as possible. You're not worried about... Let's wait two more games. The Celtics game? No oh, way. When he comes, this is basketball. It's way, not a soap opera, played, Christine. He played 19. My goodness. Uh, actually, I he don't know. He played 19. It, with LeBron, it is. Yeah, it is. Yeah, that is uh, 19 <laughs> minutes, 17 points. He looked great. He did. Why not play again? Now rest him. Good no, he's got his hip. He's got to get and healthy. And you know what? Kelly, Dr. Danny. Kelly Olenek <laughs> got a video, a tribute video. I would like to see the idea. Kelly Olenek got it. Oh, my God. Everybody gets a tribute video. If Olenek got one, Isaiah better get one.